Jesus, thank you, Jesus. We give you praise, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you this morning. You're a good and gracious spirit this morning, God. You're a righteous on your own. There is none like you, Father. We give you praise. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed, blessed is your name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Good morning, Storehouse. Is it, is it a good morning for, for you all? It's a blessed morning for us. Amen. God woke us up this morning. We are alive and well. We are clothed in our right minds. Amen. Hallelujah. Good to see you, Sister Leanne. Sister Leanne. Sister Leanne. She's yeah, 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 yeah. It's so good to see you. We love you. I love you too. <laughs> oh, well, we are back again to give God praise. Amen. He has been good to us this whole week. Yeah. He has done wondrous things. I know each of us, we have different ways that God blesses us in whether it be uh, financial healing, uh, restoration. God is working in our lives. Yeah. He is in the midst of us. Yeah. And as long as we have in, uh, the frame of mind that God is able yeah. We walk in His authority. Amen? Can we say that together? We walk in God's authority. Again, we walk in God's authority. Give Him some praise this morning. Hallelujah. Well, this morning, uh, we are here. We are happy. We are rejoicing in His presence. We expect God to move. He's already here. We we brought the Holy Spirit with us, so he's here. Amen. And as we begin our service, I'm going to ask Sister Teresa to come and open us in a word of prayer, please. Hallelujah. Let us just praise God. Lord, we just thank you this morning yes, that yes. we are able to come into your house yes, and give you praise that you are so worthy of for waking us up this morning, Father God, healing our bodies and keeping our minds and our hearts open to what the Holy Spirit has to say to us today through the worship, Father God, and through your word. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that's already here this morning, Father God. We bind anything of the enemy that's trying to come against this service today, right now, Father God. And we ask that you anoint everybody in this place right now, Father God. Even including the worshipers, Father God, and the pastor, Father God. Just let everything flow as it is supposed to flow, Father God. Let us see your heart today, Lord. Amen. Let us see your heart today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We depend upon the Holy Spirit to do everything. Amen. It is not me. We ask the Holy Spirit to rain down this morning. And I pray as you sing this song that you allow the Holy Spirit to dwell upon you, in you, and with you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, Spirit. 
Let your voice be heard, Lord, this morning. Speak this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. As we stand on your word, dear God. For you are the word. You are the living word, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. And you know, we serve such a good and gracious king. He is a wonderful, he is, he is a wonderful God, ain't he? As we sing, hallelujah.
glory belong to you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Mighty God, you are mighty God. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. This morning as we sing this other song, I know there's a lot of fear in the world right now. There's a lot of fear. But I want you to know this morning that we are no longer slaves no. to fear. Amen. So as you sing this song, let there be conviction in your heart that I am not. I am no longer. No. I'm going to be a slave to fear. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. 
Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your blood. Because it's your blood. It was blood. It was the blood. Hallelujah. There's nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you this morning. Hallelujah. Glory. Stand up, we're going to give the Lord some really good praise. Can we do that this morning? Father, we worship and praise you. We exalt the name of the Lord of the We exalt the name of Jesus. There's no other name inside of you this morning. There's none above you. There's none beside you. You alone are the most high God and worthy of praise today. We give you glory and honor and praises because you alone are the only true God. You alone are the only great God. And we worship and reverence and praise your name in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Hallelujah. There you go. Take a seat. You guys, you sing it like you meant it. So if you recall, a couple of weeks ago, we had a really marvelous prayer service in here. And um, I've had the privilege of talking to several of you for the last several weeks. And I know that, oh, my water is gone. That's not what you told me. I figured that out of my own. And I know that God is doing some amazing things in your life. And I know we have our testimony Sunday on the fifth Sunday of the month. But that's not going to happen again, I think, until October. So we're going to take just two minutes here. And if you have a testimony, I know some of you do because you've, you've texted me and talked to me all week. And I know you've got testimonies. And I know your names. And I'm not afraid to use them. <laughs> But I want you to keep it at one minute. So if you have a one minute or less testimony, I want you to run up front, look in this camera, and tell us what God is doing in your life. Amen. Go. <laughs> I'll give you $500 if you have a hard-boiled egg in your purse. <laughs> well, good, because I don't have 500 bucks. So <laughs> Your prayers, you've been praying for the last six weeks. I think it's only been six weeks. I don't even know. It seems like forever. Um, all your prayers have been answered. Lori is doing so much better. She is in the inpatient rehab in the hospital that we were praying for. And if I could get the picture to show you all of how good she Some of you saw her in the hospital. And uh, she was not looking good, but she looks great. She's got a positive attitude. She's got a little way to go with her memory, that kind of thing. But she's excited because she's closer to coming home. Amen. So I want to say thank you, but thank you, Lord. Amen. For faithfulness. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Amen. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Gaggle of testimonies. So, Pastor had that service where it was just like he couldn't do what he had preached and he had to let God do what God wanted to do in here. And we all got prayed for, and Pastor called up, you know, businesses that were struggling and suffering. And so y'all prayed for us, and the next day we received seven bids we had to go on. Oh, so the prayer changes things. Yes. 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 And that is an even more amazing part of that. How many did we land at those jobs? Uh, there's four. We've landed four jobs. So almost every bid that we've sent. 
pent out, we've got a reply back on uh, Thank when, you, when can you start? Also, on a personal note, <coughs> we were doing the 16 personality uh, testing and stuff like that, and when it came down to what was your ministry, I wrote down men's mental health, not knowing that I was struggling. So I scratched it out. <laughs> I just said men's ministry. And I was suffering from a depression that I couldn't see. And it caught me from out of the blue. I was building up, building up like a stick of dynamite. I kept on packing things down and packing things down. My wife got sick. And for me, it changed me to the point where I was paralyzed. Fear, anxiety, stress. I couldn't function. I was just making it through the day, smiling and saying, and when you hear me, I'm going to let you call me out. When I say living the dream, <laughs> hey, you know, not to say that anymore. <laughs> I was using it as an insert. I was using it as a sarcastic remark. I was using it as a serious remark. But what it was doing, it was it was sugarcoating the hurt that I was going through. Yeah. And um, through getting honest with myself, with my wife, with my pastor, and one of my closest friends came in the family, I had a breakthrough. Oh, yeah. That's pretty simple. The burden of everyday life got lifted off. It's the lies that the enemy was telling me that I wasn't worthy, that I needed to do other things and not focus on him. I had a question that had asked me by our pastor that said, uh, when was the last time you felt closest to God? And uh, I, I got honest with myself. It was 2017. Mm -hmm. And um, I was going through the motions. And through the years, building and packing it down and packing it down, I was that stick of dynamite. I was ready to put it all So as men, it's okay to cry. Yes. It's okay to let go. It's okay to set your standard. The same, you know what, this is what God's called me to do. Step out of your comfort zone. I've seen a lot of people in here step out of their comfort zone, and I felt like I was just getting stagnant and sitting in that water and wasn't doing anything. The Lord called me to a bigger thing, and he, he, he gave me reprieve. As long as I, I seek him, he's given me a reprieve. Yes. Yes. I'll tell you right now, I've, I've been in search of him in the past couple of weeks. I'm joined, uh, looking at men's meetings. I'm grabbing onto other men that don't even know. And, I, and I'm just locking arms with them and saying, hey, look, it's okay to be where you're at. Because this is only temporary. But when you seek first the kingdom of God, All right. he's going to bless you. Yeah. 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 And, uh, I want to thank you guys for your, your consistency in showing up because it shows me exactly where I need to be and it's right here with people like you to help lift me up when I'm feeling weak and opening my mouth when everything's not okay. Jesus. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Good. Yeah. Amen. So I'm assuming that testimonies are going to continue to come because as I said, that Sunday was not intended to be a once a day event where the Lord did something that day. It's intended, what the Lord told me was, to be a transformative day where the trajectory of our spiritual life changes and we start moving closer to God. And those are exactly the testimonies we're hearing. Amen? Amen. So we got some praise this morning. Come on. So let's go on my slide for Matthew. As you know, if you uh, were with us last week, we started a new series in the book of Matthew. And I would love to tell you how long this series is going to go, but the truth is, I have no clue. Uh, to the extent that I started studying Matthew chapter 2, which is where we're going this morning in a moment, and uh, I thought, okay, well, we'll get through this chapter in one session, and uh, that got hijacked, so now Matthew chapter 2 is going to be at two sessions. So you say, well, Pastor, are you making this up as you go along? Well, let me say yes, but with a caveat, I really want to be led by the Holy Spirit. Yes. And I don't want to just rush through the Bible just because we're going to rush through the Bible. And my wife said, well, how long is this going to go? And she says, are you going to do a chapter a week? And I said, I, I don't know. I really don't know. I, mean, I kind of know where I'm going. But I think it'd be really cool if the Holy Spirit just kind of leads. Amen? Amen. So last week in Matthew chapter 1, if you weren't here, we discovered three things. Matthew jumps right in and talks about the, the, uh, the bloodline and the heritage and the genealogy of Jesus. Remember that? And we thought, because how many of you read Matthew chapter 1? 
as an assignment. How many of you read it and just went, oh my word, what's next, chapter two? Because we want to kind of blow by those things. But we really talked about the importance of the genealogy and the heritage of Jesus because the Matthew ties it in to the prophecies of the Old Testament and shows that at the end of this bloodline, Jesus is indeed the Messiah who has come to earth. Can you say amen? Amen. We also learned that through the bloodline and genealogy, Say, thankfully, that God can use some fractured situations and some highly blemished people to get his will accomplished. Amen. And to that, everyone says, hallelujah. hallelujah. So your path doesn't have to be perfect to where you are today. God really specializes in using people with broken pasts and broken paths. And for that, I say, thank you, Jesus, because I am the king of wandering off. But God can corral us and bring us back in and use our life, even, listen, through our mistakes, to accomplish his plan. Now, what I don't want you to do is leave here today and say, man, pastor said it's okay if I go out and make mistakes. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we do make mistakes and we serve such a gracious and good God that he just can still use those mistakes. And accomplish his will. He just loves you so much. And then we learned, and the, my, one of my favorite parts we learned last week, is that when Jesus came and was born on the earth, it was for two reasons. Number one, to confirm that God is with us. Say, God is with me. He is Emmanuel. He is by my side. He's not watching me from afar. God is with me. And also we learned that God is with us because we need a Savior. I don't know about you, but I desperately need salvation. There is no good thing within me that's going to make me get into the kingdom of heaven. I've been watching this uh, documentary on the History Channel. If you like history, I highly recommend it. It's called Colosseum. And it's the history of the Colosseum, the Roman Colosseum, in the heyday of uh, the early church, actually, is about the time this started. And one of the episodes was about a martyr uh, named Ignatius. And he was one of the first Christian martyrs in the Roman Colosseum. And the story is just amazing. He has to walk 1,800 miles from where they arrest him to row 1,800 miles. That's like here to Canada. up Canada. Someone said Canada? Okay, I'll take Canada for 100. <laughs> so they said, walk from here to Canada. And it took, the journey took months, so they give him the Colosseum. On the way, he's writing seven letters to the church. And he's setting himself up to be the first martyr. And he tells them, he tells, he's got a scribe with him, and he says, they get to Rome, and they have to part ways. And he tells the scribe, get these letters into the hands of the churches. And do not stop what Rome is about to do. <laughs> and his death caused Christendom to explode in Rome. At the time, there was maybe a thousand Christians. Shortly after that, there was 60,000. And after that, there was over 100,000 Christians because the emperor's plan backfired. And people saw that he was willing to stand for the Lord. But one of the... Uh, Scholars they were interviewing at this time said this phrase. She said, Christianity was relatively new at the time, and she made this statement, and I cringed. She said, And if you lived, Christians believe that if you lived a good enough life, you would spend eternity with God. And I said, er, That's wrong. You can't do anything good enough to spend eternity with God. That's the reason we need a Savior. We're fractured and irreparably broken outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, dear History Channel, get your facts right. Amen. Yeah. Maybe I'll write him an email. All right, so that was all Matthew chapter 1. So, Matthew chapter 2 is where we're going today, but I don't want to pull up the scripture yet. I want you to think about this. When we think of the Christmas story, what do we think about? The manger. The magi. The magi. The baby Jesus, shepherds. the shepherds, star. the star. We, you know, we tend to associate the Christmas story with the Gospel of Luke. Because Luke picks up the Christmas story of the birth of Christ. And we have commercialized it over the centuries to that now when we think of the Christmas story, and I have preached so many Christmas messages, can I just tell you as a pastor, at some point it gets really hard to find a fresh Christmas message. <laughs> 
I think this year we're going to take Christmas from the perspective of the donkey. I mean, we're down to that. I don't know what else to do. I mean, we haven't talked about the donkey yet. So. so we get this picture from the book of Luke. And listen, go here with me in your mind. We have this picture of just this beautiful scene where Jesus is in the manger. We don't call it a feeding trough. We call it a manger. And Mary is kind of kneeled down beside him and Joseph and they're gazing lovingly at him and the shepherds are kind of peering in and the animals are all there and they're, they're bowing down and they're showing their reverence and the wise men are there, which is totally not according to scripture and the stars above the sky and we get this, we get this, this picture that it's just this amazingly serene time in the birth of Christ. I'm sorry, Jesus was born in a cave by a desperate mother and father who had to lay him in an animal's feeding trough. Yeah, that's right. He did not come into the world in this peaceful, wonderful environment. Jesus. And we sing, silent night, holy night, all is calm and all is bright. <laughs> Round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant, so tender. My, and those, I love Christmas. I'm not, I'm not belittling Christmas. I love Christmas. I love the songs. But Matthew does something radically different in the Christmas story. And today, you're going to get a Christmas story message with a title that you've never heard of called All Hell Breaks Loose. <laughs> yes, it's a Christmas message. All Hell Breaks Loose. Today's part one, acknowledging the new king. Pastor, you crazy. Yes, I am. Matthew brings, here's what we see in the book of Matthew. That under this veneer of this calm, serene, beautiful, majestic, reverent scene, Matthew is saying, no, 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 no. You've got to meet the players and see what really happens. So let's get into Matthew chapter 2. Are you with me? Say, let's go. Let's go. I highlighted some words in yellow that I want you to think about because they're going to pertain to the message for the next two Sundays. Jesus was born in the town of? In Judea, during the reign of? King Herod. Remember that name. I should have highlighted that, but remember his name. Say, I'm going to remember King Herod. At about that time, some astrologers or magi, Matthew calls them magi. I picked this translation because I like some of the other words, and we're going to talk about this. At about that time, some astrologers from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking what? Where is the newborn king, Where is this newborn king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in far off eastern lands and have come to worship him. Next slide, please. Thank you. King Herod was what? He was deeply troubled by this. I don't think we're grasping what's going on here. We're going to cover more of that next week. But he's just, just beside himself with this news. And he was beside himself because of their question. And the rest of Jerusalem was filled with rumors. I can understand that. Word starts getting out. People start whispering, right? So he called a meeting of the Jewish religious leaders. And he said, did the prophets tell us where the Messiah would be born? Interesting. What did the wise men ask him? Where is this king of the Jews? What does Herod ask the religious leaders? Do the prophets tell us where the... The Messiah would be born. Ah, uh, you getting this? You understand why he's a little bit disturbed? Yes. They replied, yes, in Bethlehem, they said. For this is what the prophet Micah wrote. Micah wrote a Christmas song saying, O little town of Bethlehem. <laughs> you are not just an unimportant Judean village. For a governor shall rise from you to rule my people in Israel. Next slide. Then Herod sent a private message to the astrologers, asking them to come by and see him. And at this meeting, he found out the exact time when they what? When they, remember this, when they first saw the star. So that implies there's some time, right? Yes. Stay with me. This is going to be so much fun. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search for the child. Hey, when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go there and worship him too. Oh, don't get ahead of me. That's next week's message. Next slide. 
All right, Kenny, if you don't see the bottom lines on it, we gotta go from slide to slide, okay? After this interview, the astrologers started out again. And look, the star appeared to them, say again. again. This is so cool, I'm so excited. The star appeared to them again, standing over Bethlehem, and I, my favorite verse in this whole story is, say it with me, their joy knew no bounds. Why? We're going to see the king. Oh, that's amazing. Entered, entering the house where the baby and Mary, his mother, were, they threw themselves down before him, worshiping him. Then they opened their presents, and they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But when they returned to their own land, they didn't go through Jerusalem to report to Herod, for God had warned them in a dream to go home another way. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray that as we unpack it today, we get to see really what is going on behind the scenes. That this is a deeply, deeply, deeply spiritual event. It's not just a story. Lord, this is the greatest single event in the history of the world. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Say amen. amen. All right, so to really understand this, I want to meet, I want you to meet some characters and understand some things for this half of the message. So number one, I, let's talk about the Magi. What are the Magi? Well, interesting. Matthew calls them the Magi. Many of the other translations call them astronomers or astrologers. Now, an astrologer is one who looks at the stars and does what? He reads the future. That's where horoscopes come from. So if you're messing with horoscopes, don't do that. The Bible says it's witchcraft. Yes. It's not our job as Christians to open up the paper and say, oh, my horoscope says this to me today. Someone says, well, what's your sign, Pastor? And I said, my sign is the cross. That's right. Amen. And the only voice I follow is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that's harsh. No, the Bible calls it witchcraft. Stop playing. Right. The Bible doesn't, God don't play with that stuff. Don't go see mediums and palm readers. You want your palm read? Come to me and I'll say, you know what your palm says to me? You should put $50 in there and give it to the church. <laughs> so they're called astrologers and astronomers. An astrologer reads the stars and tries to predict things in people's lives. An astronomer reads the stars and studies the heavens. Now, Matthew uses the word magi, which is where we get our word magic. magician, magic, magician from, right? So I want you to see this in a bigger view. What Matthew is describing are a group of men that are well-learned, highly trained, specialized in studying the stars, and have been known to be able to predict the future and to decipher the meaning of strange events. Are you with me? Because yeah. this is pretty cool. Say, this is pretty cool. This is pretty cool. So the Magi, who have studied stars all of their life, have determined, now here's what they also believe. Astrologers and astronomers also in ancient times believed this, that correlations of the earth and the heavens were very real. So that if something incredible was taking place on the earth, the heavens would declare that and confirm it. Conversely, if something amazing was happening in the heavens, the earth would flow over. So there was a correlation between the relationship of heaven and earth. Are you getting this? Amen. So they see this star and they go, they draw the conclusion, something spectacular is happening on the earth. That's how they're trained. Now, theologians and scientists have tried to figure out for years what star did they see. Some people believe it was Halley's Comet, but the timing doesn't work out for Halley's Comet. You know what it does work out for? This is so cool. Around 6 and 7 BC, in three, three times in a time period, the planets Jupiter and Saturn lined up and formed such an alignment that it became the brightest thing in the sky. Now, we don't really understand this because we live in a world that is filled with light pollution. Very difficult for us to go outside of our house and really see the stars. But in the ancient world where they didn't have street lights and building lights and cars, and they lived mostly in the desert in the Far East, 
Stars are, have you ever been camping somewhere where there was no lights? Yes. It's stars, there are billions of stars. I go out in front of my house and I'm like, well, there's a few stars out tonight. My wife and I were up in Alaska and everywhere we uh, anchored for the night, there was no houses, no lights, no electricity. They just shut the boat down at night and you could walk out on this vessel and I'm telling you, it's spectacular. It is. Yep. So check this out. This is so cool. So three times around the birth of Jesus, Saturn and Jupiter line up. And they become visually one incredibly bright star in the sky. Huh. Jupiter is known as the planet of royalty or kings. Saturn is associated with um, representing the Jewish nation. Are you following me? So Jupiter, the planet of royalty, is lining up with Saturn, which is associated with the Jewish nation. And these very wise and learned men decipher that, wait a minute, something is happening, some royalty is being born into the Jewish nation, and this is such a spectacular sign, we've got to go check this out. Wow! Am I the only one excited? That's brilliant. I got so excited about this, I stopped studying. I thought, boy, this is just crazy cool. Isn't it amazing how God gives us signs to point us to the Savior? They're all around us, by the way, Paul says. If you don't think God exists, read Romans chapter 1. He's in everything that goes on around us. Do you think this body just came from evolution? God worked hard on me. I have miles of blood vessels and nerves. I have a brain that functions almost all the time. I have a personality that is uniquely mine. This isn't, I didn't come from a frog or a toad or a tadpole or a monkey or a dinosaur or an elephant. Well, maybe an elephant. I think I'm related more to manatees and hippos that eat salad, move slowly, and still gain weight. But what an amazing thing that the Magi discovered. Can you say amen? amen. Let me make sure I've covered all the Magi, because this is kind of important. Do you agree? Say amen. amen. Here's what I love. So they go to see. So let me point out just a couple of things. The passage we read said that Herod called the wise guys in. Wise guys. That's why I said Hey, I'd like to see those wise guys, please. Hey, what's up? No, no, no. This could make my highlight reel for 2022. So he calls in the wise men and he says, he says, Tell me where this star is. Actually, he's asked them, how long, when did you first see this star? So I want you to understand something. We have this picture of the wise men kneeling down at the, at the feeding trough with Jesus in the manger. It's highly likely the wise men showed up about two years after yes. Jesus is born. Yes. Yes. They have been following this star for over two years yes. to get to where Jesus is. Check this out. I got excited about this too. So they're in Jerusalem. Right? The star leads them to Jerusalem, and apparently it goes away for a little bit. I don't know if the sun came up. I don't know what happened, but they're in Jerusalem. They're talking to Herod, and they say, Herod says, well, how long have you been following this? And he tells them, and they leave, and they step outside, and we just read, the star has reappeared, and it's right overhead in Bethlehem, and their joy cannot be contained. You know why? Check this out. I did a study this morning. Bethlehem to Jerusalem, five miles they walk outside, and this star is literally going to lead them just five more miles. I don't even think we can comprehend how bright the star is. And they get overjoyed because they realize that within the next hour and a half, they're going to be where the king of the Jews yeah. resides. And they walk in, and they see Mary, and they see Jesus. He's not in the manger. He's probably walking at this time, talking. I don't know. He's doing miracles at home. I don't know what he's doing at two years old. And they walk in and they present gifts, which tells me this. They had the foresight to bring specific gifts to the Christ child. So let's talk about that. First gift they brought was what? Gold. Why is gold important? 
What's significant about gold? Money. What's that? Money. It riches. Rare. It's rare. It's pretty. It's pretty. It's pretty. Yes. <laughs> You're okay. It, it is pretty. Yes. They brought him. So in today's version, if I were writing the Bible, uh, the Gospel according to Eric, they brought him bling. bling. <laughs> so it's pretty. It's expensive. It's rare. It's it's everlasting. We use it in our wedding bands, right? To represent my love for you is everlasting. Did you say something else? It doesn't tarnish. Doesn't tarnish. It's pure. So check this out. I got so... Okay, I started studying this just as a side note on myself. And this is as far as we're going to get in today's message. Is the three gifts they brought because the Lord just really opened my eyes to some stuff. here. How many of you are thankful your pastor still learns stuff? Yeah. So check this out. Because of its scarcity and its value, gold was always associated with royalty and nobility. Hmm. Matter of fact, in scripture, when you wanted to know a person's wealth, there was like three common things that determined their wealth. Land, livestock, and gold. gold. Now remember, it's reserved for royalty and nobility. So what does that tell you about what their thoughts are for Jesus? That they're coming to see the king. That they're bringing gold reserved for royalty as a gift for Jesus. But here's what's really cool. You ready to say really cool? Really cool. I believe that these gifts foreshadow exactly what Jesus was going to do and who he becomes. Because check this out. All of these gifts correlate to the Old Testament. And this is why I got kind of excited. In the Old Testament, when they built the temple, there was a place in the temple called the Holy of Holies. Are you familiar with this? So pull up my scripture in 1 Kings. Check this out. The inner room, or the Holy of Holies, or the, the, the Holy Place, as it was called, the inner room was 30 feet long by 30 feet wide, by 30 feet high. It was all covered with the altar was covered with cedar panels. The inside of the entire temple was covered with and gold chains were placed across the entrance of the inner room which was also covered with the whole interior of the temple of the temple was covered with as well as the altar in the most high place or the holy of holies. Are you catching this? Amen. Now here's the cool thing. The priest went into the holy of holies to do two things. To One, to encounter the presence of God. And secondly, to offer the sacrifice of atonement for the sins of all of Israel. And that place was entirely covered with gold. What did Jesus come to do? Bring the presence of God, Emmanuel, to us and to offer himself the sacrifice to cover all of our sins. So the gold is so beautiful. Paints this, foreshadows this picture of Jesus being the atonement of sins in our life and reminding us that we are in the presence of of God himself. That's pretty cool. Say hallelujah. I got really excited, but maybe I just had too much coffee that day. I don't know. <laughs> Secondly, they brought frankincense. What do you know about frankincense? Anything? It's what? Not yet. Nope. That's next. It's an anointing oil. Kind of. So frankincense is, uh, is, 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 is still used today and it basically comes from a bark of a tree in the far east and it is used as primarily as an incense uh, but because it was so pricey and so expensive not every home had it it wasn't your average air freshener <laughs> it was reserved and always related to worship of gods and deities in religious ceremonies so they bring this frankincense. Let me check one more thing to make sure I'm giving you all the facts. So because of its cost, it was precluded from being just a common air freshener in the house. Here's what's cool. 
Frankincense is burned in religious ceremonies as people come to worship deity. And they bring this frankincense. Now, how does that tie into the Old Testament? Well, check this out. In the Old Testament, it starts in the tabernacle. Remember the tabernacle is what they carried through the desert because that had the presence of God in it. And that's where they did their worshiping and their sacrificing. And then after the tabernacle had run its course, they built the what? The temple. So check this out in Exodus chapter 30. God gives Moses, while he's constructing, while he's working in the tabernacle, these instructions. Check this out. These were the Lord's directions to Moses concerning the incense. Use sweet spices. Stack tea, anica, gal galbanum, I practiced that all morning, and pure what? Right. Weighing out the same amounts of each using the usual techniques of the incense maker and seasoning it with salt, and it shall be a what? A pure and holy incense. They're using this in the tabernacle. They carry this tradition into the temple. So anytime they were coming into worship, they used this specific. God's very specific about what to burn. Why? Because this is pure and holy fragrance offering before the Lord. Wow. Kind of what Jesus is. He gave his life to be the pure and holy offering before the Lord. It's just amazing how God moves in this and ties all of this in the Old Testament. <coughs> Lastly, they bring myrrh. Say it with me. Myrrh. myrrh. Come on, that's fun to say. Say myrrh. myrrh. It's just fun to say. I would, have, I would like to go buy some myrrh. So they bring myrrh. Okay, now, what is myrrh known for? This, this is where Pastor Dale comes in. What is myrrh known for? Burial. Burial. Myrrh, check this out. Myrrh, I gotta read this because I don't want to mess it up. So, like frankincense, myrrh can be used as incense, but in the ancient world, it also had wider usage as a perfume, anointing oil, and it was even ingested as medicine. Most notably, with regard to Jesus' life, myrrh was the key ingredient in the mixture of spices used to prepare a body for burial. Let's look at John chapter 19. Say Nicodemus, Nicodemus. Who had first gone to see Jesus at night. You remember? Nicodemus was a Pharisee or a scribe on Pharisee. And he was intrigued with Jesus. But he couldn't risk his reputation being ruined. So he went to see Jesus at night. Amen. And you know, it's easy to say, well, that's not, I don't want to. He went to see Jesus. We should be excited about that. He risked his reputation to find out who this Jesus was. So he went to see Jesus at night. So he went with Joseph, taking with him about 100 pounds of spices. I spent a half a day pondering this. That's not a bag of spice. That's like a donkey full of spice. 100 pounds of spices. with a mixture of myrrh and aloes. So they mixed all of this, a hundred pounds worth. The two men took Jesus' body and they wrapped it in linen cloths with the spices according to the Jewish custom of preparing a body for burial. And I was pondering this even this morning in my office and I thought, how fragrant must that have been? with the myrrh and the aloes and the spices. I'm sure frankincense was probably part of the spice mix. And how fragrant. Remember, Jesus has already been anointed by Mary with perfume and aloe. And he carried that scent to the grave with him. And now they're preparing this body. What's amazing, I was thinking about this, because this is how my mind works. Normally we associate death, and three days later he would be decaying and not smelling too good. And the spices would probably cover that up. But there was no need to cover that up. Because he immediately rose from the dead. Yes. Descended into heaven. Amen. There was no decay. Yeah. So this fragrance must have just filled the tomb. Wow. <laughs> you know, we talk about the fragrance of the Lord. And the fragrance of the Holy Spirit. There's a song I'm learning. It's on the piano. But one of the lines is, We love the fragrance of your holy name. You came and brought us 
into your righteousness. So there's fragrance. But here's the thing. So the wise men bring this frankincense in this myrrh. I believe understanding that Jesus was going to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins and that sacrifice would be the giving of his life. Isn't it amazing how God ties all this in yeah. to foreshadow what's going to happen in the next 33 years? So next time we read the Christmas story together in Christmas, let's remember just how remarkable this event is. Go back to verse 2. I've got it up here. I want to, I want to circle back for just a minute. So obviously the wise men, next slide. Obviously the wise men, understood the signs of the times. They understood the alignment of these planets and that something spectacular was taking place on the earth. And they also interpreted all of that correctly, I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit and understanding of the scriptures, that truly the Messiah had come. So we're going back to verse 1 and 2. At about the same time, the Magi from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking this question. Say it with me. Where is the newborn king of the Jews? And it's that question, that one question, that one acknowledgement, that stirs an amazing, amazing spiritual battle that is still taking place today. Because Herod flips out and just blows his mind. So next week, we're going to learn about Herod. Next slide. In chapter 2 of All Hell Breaks Loose. Let me give you some applications to take with you today, and then we're going to have communion. Application number one. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Are you seeking the king? Listen, even if you know Christ, are you constantly seeking his presence? Are you constantly seeking him to be the king and the Lord of your life? Because the signs are all around us that Jesus is real. Say amen. amen. Listen, we heard testimonies this week and last week. And we're going to continue to hear testimonies about how God is moving in our lives and transforming us and changing us and changing circumstances and people around us and doing the miraculous. The signs are all around us. I love the saying that says, wise men still seek him. Amen. Second application is this. Just like the wise men, an encounter with Jesus can bring joy in your life that knows no bounds. Amen. No, I love that phrasing. And their joy knew no... When was the last time you were giddy with joy? When was the last time that you had such anticipation that you were just crazy excited? Jesus can do that to you. Third application is this. What gifts are you presenting to the king? Do they have value? When I was a kid in the 70s, and I was in church, Sister Remington, who had to be about 204 years old, she was my Sunday school teacher, <laughs> she told stories about Jesus as if she lived with him. That's, she was pretty old. Loved her dearly, dearly. She put a play together for Christmas one year, and I had... We all just memorized some lines. And I don't remember my whole lines, but I remember my portion of the play was called The Gift. And I was 11 years old. And I don't remember anything else except one line in that play. And basically my version of that was, the section she gave me was, pondering, what can I give Jesus? And the only line I remember memorizing is, I'll give myself to Jesus. Because that's really all I have. And you know what? The greatest value you can bring to the king is yourself. And then once you get there, you bring your gifts and your talents and your time. And you pour out into ministry and you serve other people as you serve him. What are you bringing to Jesus? I have one more. Sorry, there's four. And have you acknowledged that Jesus Christ is king? I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. Let's go there. Paul writes this to the church of Philippi. Next slide. He says, Christ was truly God, but he did not try to remain equal with God. Instead, he gave up everything and became a slave when he became like one of us. 
Next slide. Stay with me. Christ was humble. He obeyed God and even died on a cross. Then God gave Christ the highest place and honored his name above all other names. So that in the name of Jesus, everyone will bow down those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. And to the glory of the Father, say it with me, everyone will openly agree, Jesus Christ is Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. Come on. So if you're here this morning and you say, well, how is making Jesus a king in my life relevant to this? Because a king is simply someone that has authority over your life. Somebody that has control of your life. Someone that has the best interest to be in mind. And Jesus, while everybody wants a savior, Jesus wants to be our Lord. Amen. He wants us to commit our lives to him. Amen. And if you haven't done that in your life, then today is a great day to do that. We're going to participate in communion here. I've asked Pastor Dale if he would come up and do communion for us this morning. So I'm going to turn the communion service over here. I have the black mic in my hand. This is going to Pastor Dale. Mic is on. We're going to take just a few moments, finish with communion, and then Pastor Dale will turn it back over to me, and we will do uh, some announcements this morning. Hello. Okay. Are we on? Good. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Pastor gave me 10 minutes. <laughs> Got a little, do a little work here, but first. Uh, yeah, hang in with, with me, okay? We're, we're getting there. Uh, messing up somebody's great work. Who put together the communion table this morning? Nobody did. Marcia, usually. Oh, Marcy. She, no, she's not. Lauren did it. Lauren did it. Oh, Lauren. Lauren did it. Okay. So I'm messing up your table, Lauren. Sorry. Um, I'm really messing things up here. Um, Out is that 
It always has to be anyway, is that Jesus, it's, it, it says very clearly in the passages that he, he, he took the bread and the loaves, the fish, uh, whatever it was that was given to him. And it didn't matter that it was loaves of bread and fish. Uh, could have been pomegranates and oranges. We don't know. Could have been anything. Because the key issue here is that Jesus looked up into heaven. And he gave thanks. And things started happening. All of a sudden, there was more than two loaves, fishes. All of a sudden, there was much, much more than that, enough to feed thousands of people. In other words, things were being multiplied. And it says that, that uh, not only did they feed all those thousands of people, but there was 12 baskets left over. There was such an abundance that the disciples had to go around and pick up all the leftovers. Not that, not that Jesus was promoting the idea of leftovers. That's not the issue. I mean, we like that at Thanksgiving time, you know. I love turkey sandwiches after, after Thanksgiving. It doesn't get much better than that. Turkey tetrazzini, you know. I can go on by. It's not about leftovers. It's about abundance. And what brought about that abundance? And it wasn't the fact that that little boy came with a little bit. It wasn't that it was fish. It wasn't that it was bread. The sole issue here was that it was about Thanksgiving. Because as soon as Jesus looked up into heaven and he blessed the bread and he broke it, the abundance came. All of a sudden, there was such an abundance that uh, everybody got fed. There was leftovers. There was another time that Jesus did that too. And it's what we typically call the Last Supper. When Jesus took the uh, elements that he was beginning to institute, we, we, they called it wine and, and bread. Now, we use grape juice or whatever. But again, he looked up into heaven and he blessed the elements that were being instituted as what we call the Last Supper. He broke those elements. Well, he just passed around the cup. Everybody took a sip and he said, Everybody partake. It wasn't optional. It wasn't that, well, there's a two or three of you here that, that should take this and the rest of you just kind of watch. No, it was he purposely said, All of you, you look it up in Jeff Matthew 26. He said, All of you, all of you participate. All of you partake of these elements. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, we, we typically read that. It says, for this, the, uh, for on the night that he was betrayed, and Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. We, we very often read that, that portion. Uh, but it's amazing to me that Immediately after 1 Corinthians chapter 11 becomes 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Come on, you count. Chapter 12. Well, what's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Oh. Oh. Spiritual gifts. And can I tell you that it's not an exhaustive list. Sometimes we preach it like it's an exhaustive list, like there's only nine of them. And 
it speaks of my gifts there, but I, I can tell you from my experience in 40 years of preaching, it's not an exhaustive list. First Corinthians chapter 12 speaks of at least nine spiritual gifts that are passed out to the disciples. First Corinthians 13 talks about love. love. Oh, is there any limit to love? No, I'm talking about abundance. Have we experienced an abundance here this morning? Oh, such an abundance. This is what church is all about. We look up into heaven and we bless things. And an abundance just particularly shows up. Our businessmen, uh, their wives, just experienced this past week an abundance. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Kenny's going, yeah. Yes, sir. I say, they haven't seen bits like that come in for a long time. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. The blessings are flowing. Amen. Because they give thanks. That's what this this is what this table is all about. It's the Lord's table. And you all participate. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's give thanks. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you gave all your blood. You didn't reserve any of it. You gave all of your life, Lord, for all of us. You gave away completely of heaven come to this earth as we just learned here this morning out of Matthew 2. Lord, you gave it all. You gave everything for us. Lord, there was nothing held in reserve. And so this morning, Lord, we're just going to take a minute and thank you. Thank you, Lord, that because of the blood of Jesus, because of your life, Lord, we have life. Because of, of your giving to us, Lord, all the word says, Lord, that that when we were still dead in our trespasses and sin, you died for us. You demonstrated your love for us long before we were here. Lord, we thank you for thinking of us even before time began. We thank you, Lord, that you called us out of darkness into light. We thank you, Lord, that you applied the blood to our lives so we could live as free men and women in Jesus' name free from all that the world would wreck us with. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for it all. Hallelujah. And as we think of these elements here this morning, we're going to think of your blood. We're going to think of your body that was broken for us and the blood poured out. The Bible says that's the new covenant for us. The blood of the covenant for us. Lord, just bless these elements to our bodies. Bless us to this body. Bless us in Jesus' name as we give thanks in our heart for all that you've done for us. Amen. 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 Come up and partake of the elements.
the bread and they broke it. And they took it and they gave thanks unto the Lord. covenant with us. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Amen. Lord. Thank you. Oh, Lord, and you don't go back on your covenants. Hallelujah. They are for eternity. Yes. And Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. We have life in Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Can you give the Lord some praise this morning? Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us this day. Thank you for your presence and your goodness, Lord. Thank you that we can celebrate who you are and what you've done. Thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to recognize you as King of Kings yes, Lord. and Lord of Lords. In Jesus' name, everyone say amen. amen. Don't go away. We have some announcements that are very, very important. Say, I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to pay attention. All right, all four of you, listen up. <laughs> if you don't have our app, download the app. If you're first time visiting, text us or new to the number on the screen. Next slide, please. Hey, ladies, our Women of Worth have a meeting on Sunday. Go back. Go, go get ahead of me now. I know. you got to click on it. It won't move. Um, it's on the move. So Sunday, September 18th, there's a women's meeting. My wife says, if you are going to the women's beach retreat, this is a mandatory meeting. Is that correct, honey? Yeah. And when she says that, take her seriously. So Sunday, <laughs> September 18th, after service, Women of Worth mandatory meeting. Next slide. That is the, win, the Women's Beach Retreat. So Women's Beach Getaway takes place. Still time to sign up, honey? Yes? Yes, there is. Thank you, Karen. Uh, there is still time to sign up. A mere $275 for an amazing weekend in the presence of the most remarkable women in, the, in Florida. And, gosh, bonus... The presence of Lord of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Say amen. amen. If you haven't gone to that, you really need to go. It is a remarkable event. So I have been told. Next up. Hey, guardsmen, we're going to meet this Saturday, 8.30. Uh, breakfast and fellowship. We are journaling Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7. Let's journal it before. Don't sit out in your car and journal when you get here. Journal at home. Have it ready when you get here. 8.30, we are serving breakfast. We have a very special breakfast made by yes. yours truly. So if you feel adventurous and your faith is strong, come eat breakfast Saturday morning. Next up. All right. Very important announcement. Look at your pastor and say, all right, pastor, what do you got? All right. What do you got? What do you got? We desperately need to remodel the house next door where the Moors live. They have been patient and gracious but things are not working, things are falling apart. The house is not up to code electric, electrically, it's not. So there's some issues and you know what? It is God's property and my job and our job is to shepherd and steward God's property. Amen, Pastor, I'm with you. <laughs> our job is to steward God's property. I am a big believer. Listen, first impressions are big. Yes. And when people come on site, this ought to be a place that is first off attractive and functional and for crying out loud, everything should work. Amen? Yes. So the Morris have been so gracious and so patient, but it is time to put some money in that house. The sanctuary looks good. The fellowship hall looks good. We have air conditioning. We have windows. We can use the bathroom because we have a septic system. We're pretty good here. We have got to put money into the house. Say amen. amen. So listen, here's what I know. Every project we've had, God has been faithful. Yes. We put $9,000 into a septic system. And everyone said, hallelujah. hallelujah. We have new windows that have lowered our uh, um, energy costs. Thank you so much. We've painted. We've had our carpets cleaned. We've uh, put sod in the backyard. We've done all of that 
with no debt. What else? Yes, if, in case you weren't here three years ago, you're not familiar with the fact that we used to park on sand with potholes because of the rain. So God has done amazing things, and he's always, always, always come through. So our, you know the only debt in this church is our mortgage. That's our only debt. So here's, I've spelled this out, what we need. Cabinets, $5,000. Electrical, we've already paid for the first half. The second half of electrical is $4,000. We need new appliances. The Moors told me they opened up the refrigerator a couple weeks ago and the shelf broke and fell out. I told the Moors, I said, if we really want to sell this, let's move fellowship to the house for the next two Sundays and make everybody cook and set up fellowship in the house. Suddenly it would be a very urgent need. That's unacceptable that the refrigerator is broken. We need appliances. Now, let me tell you, um, appliances are a refrigerator, which is being donated to the church. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. We also need a dishwasher, a sink, a um, stove top and oven, a microwave. So appliances, we're pegging at about $2,000, which I think is a fair price. The demo and in in install will be handled by Set Apart Remodeling. It's $7,500. They are wiping out all of the existing kitchen. We're knocking down a wall and making it a half wall so that the room will be bigger. That demo and install includes knocking out cabinets, uh, ca putting in new cabinets, new countertops, installing the dishwasher, the sink, the stove, the microwave, and the new refrigerator. Flooring. What else? Flooring. Oh, we're doing flooring? Yes, sir. I should pay attention in the council <laughs> meetings. <laughs> And we're doing flooring. Now, I'm smart enough to know that every project in my house has unforeseen issues, usually because I've hammered something incorrectly. So I think that next door we could possibly have unforeseen issues. So I've added $1,500. The bottom line is this. We need to get this done. We've done phase one of the electric. We have a new box outside, and we put a new box inside the house. We've got, we can't bring other electricity in until we demo the walls, get everything out of the way, run new electricity for every appliance, get it up to code. It is not up to code. And we're going to be up to code in this church. Say amen. amen. We've got to get this done. I'm asking you to please consider what God would have you do so that we can raise $20,000 and get this done. God has been remarkably faithful. I am not sweating this. I'm not losing sleep over it. I will tell you this. If your pastors put their money where their mouth is. My wife and I will be, rent, will be writing a check for several thousand dollars towards this project. So I'm not up here just asking for things that we don't do. We will lead the way. I would give you an amount, but my wife and I haven't talked about it and agreed on it yet. And I know that even when you drive separate cars, that's a good way to get in trouble with your spouse. <laughs> Unless you want to throw out a figure, honey, and I'll just agree with you. <laughs> we haven't talked about it. We haven't talked about it. You're right. That is a wise woman. So I do know this. We will lead the way. We will have a check ready for the church. So I'm asking you to please, 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 let's take care of the house in the Lord. Amen. The Moors have been remarkable. They're great tenants. They do so much for us. And the list is exhausting. It's when I get tired watching their family. And you know what? They deserve a great place to live. Yes, and do. we deserve to take care of the Lord's house. Amen? Amen? Yes. All right. That concludes all of my announcements for today. I believe that's the last announcement. It is. So stand with me if you would. We're going to ask you to uh, give your tithes and offerings this morning in the four usual ways. You know how to do that. I'm going to ask you also one more announcement I want to tie in. On the, listen up. On the Sunday of the Women's Beach Getaway, we are still having service at the storehouse. But listen carefully. If you're coming... It's Uber Casual Sunday. Wear your favorite sports uh, attire. You can, you can rep your team. We're going to have about 30 minutes of church, short worship, a really good word. Then we're going to dismiss. We're doing a barbecue out back. We're sitting on cornhole, some other games. We're going to make it a Sunday of fellowship. Ladies, if you're not on the beach retreat, please come out and hang out with us men. Hang out. Be ready to eat. We're doing burgers, hot dogs, sides, and desserts. We're just going to have a day to fellowship and enjoy the presence of the Lord. Amen. Father, you're awesome today. What a great day. What a great word and worship in the house of the Lord today. Father, as we tie all of the Old Testament in the arrival of the King of the Jews, Jesus, the Messiah. We love you this morning, Lord. We dismiss, not from your presence, 
Lord, but uh, into fellowship with one another in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. 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 If you're staying for the Proclaim meeting, give us about 15 minutes for the council to do what they got to do. And then we're moving to the conference room and having some training on Proclaim. You are dismissed.